missing being uh, with you all. I would have loved to travel, but this corona has completely bottled us in. Sitting on the same chair, giving lecture after lecture gets boring at times. But this time the topic is interesting. Um, I'm supposed to speak on selection of anti-diabetic agents in people with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. Before I give a, any talk on type 2 diabetes nowadays, I started showing this slide. Try to prove the point that we doctors only contribute 25 to 30 percent in the management of type 2 diabetes. Ideally, that should be the situation. The majority of the management should be done by the individual himself or herself with help from a dietitian, a diabetic nurse specialist, and diabetic educators. Uh, the doctor's role should be not, not the main role. Unfortunately, in our country, it's the other way around. The doctor has to bear the majority of the role. He has to be the dietitian. He has to be the diabetes nurse educator. And along the way, given the short amount of time he or she has, we somehow fall short of giving a full holistic care to our diabetic patients. Not only focusing on glycemic control, but we need to focus on blood pressure, lipids, weights, get them off smoking alcohol, think about the, com uh, the complications. And as the speaker before me was talking, combination therapy is a very a topic very close to my heart, and I agree that we should start with combination therapy in the very beginning. But that is not my brief today. My brief is people with type 2 diabetes, a very specialized population now. We are zooming in not on the Bando type 2 diabetic, but we're zooming in on the type 2 diabetic people with heart failure. So when we talk with diabetes and heart failure, what is new? This is the latest. This has come out just about six weeks ago. The definition of heart failure, I won't say has changed dramatically, but has been, has been tweaked. The stages of heart failure have been tweaked and the LVEF based heart failure that you and I knew has slightly been modified, not a huge modification. So what is the heart failure? Heart failure has got two components. One component is clinical syndrome, which is symptoms or signs. Now, symptoms or signs are very vague. Uh, some of the symptoms like fatigue, a little bit of shortness of breath uh, can be present in many of our type 2 diabetic patients, especially the ones who are obese. A little bit of ankle edema here and there. You press, you may get it a couple of rounds, you may hear here, 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 the chest. So that is, those are called the symptoms. The, the ones who come with barn door heart failure with, you know, raised JVP, you know, ascites or, uh, or ankle edema, they don't come to you and me. They go to our cardiology colleagues corroborated by at least one or the other. Either we do a, a natriuretic peptide level, or we show some objective evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary or systemic congestion, either by chest X-ray, or by echocardiogram, or by right heart configuration, or by pulmonary artery catheterization. Now, right heart catheter, pulmonary artery catheter, et cetera, we can't do. So in a clinic, if you suspect uh, heart failure, you probably need to do a BNP. I will come to it as to how often we can do it. Uh, maybe a chest x-ray and plus minus an echocardiogram. If you do a BNP, then this is the, these are the cutoffs. Uh, 125 picograms per uh, ml is the NT pro BNP level. Doing a BNP probably also is acceptable, but probably NT pro BNP probably is better. And if you see, if you want to diagnose decompensated heart failure, the value has to be more than 300. The, the latest uh, EMPA, Gliflozin, Preserved Heart Failure Study used the inclusion criteria of NT pro BNP more than 300. Now, how do you classify heart failure? You can classify it in various different ways. You can classify it based on LVEF, on the NYHA classification, on stages of heart failure. The term compensated versus decompensated is slowly, slowly moving away from the lexicon. And of course, the underlying etiology, whether it's valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease, ischemic heart disease, or the one we are discussing today, diabetic cardiomyopathy. What is the change in the definition of heart failure with regards to ejection fraction? Not a big change, actually. Less than 40 is HEF-REF. More than 50 is HEF-PEF. 41 to 49 is mildly reduced. Mildly reduced uh, EF. This is the new terminology which has been brought in, which is called uh, heart failure with improved ejection fraction, i.e. somebody had a heart, this happens very commonly in, in the clinic actually, somebody comes with a heart failure, ejection fraction is 32%, gets very nice if you by a cardiology colleague, and the ejection fraction is now 55%. What do you call this gentleman now? Is it HEP-REF or HEP-PEF? So basically he remains a HEP-REF. All the trials on HEP-REF apply to this patient in, despite the fact that the EF has gone up to 55 now because he started with the reduced ejection fraction, but the terminology will now change and you have to call it <laughs> heart failure with improved ejection fraction. NYHA class, we all know, uh, class one is basically uh, ordinary activity, does not cause any heart, uh, any symptoms. 
And uh, class two and three are the ones which are mostly included in all of the studies. So you should know what it's class. Class four is very easy. Uh, and by class four, when they are basically uh, uh, symptomatic at rest. So class two is slight limitation of physical activity, the comfortable at rest, but day-to-day -day activity, walking from one room to the other, uh, walking from uh, a house to the uh, to, 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 to a shop nearby causes, causes shortness of breath. And NYJ class is marked limitation of physical activity, comfortable at rest, but less than ordinary activity causes shortness of breath. This is the newer concept about stages of heart failure, at risk for heart failure. Anybody and everybody that is of heart failure. If you have diabetes, you have risk for heart failure. If you have obese, you have risk for heart failure. Hypertension, risk for heart failure. CBD, risk for heart failure. Family history of cardiomyopathy, you have risk for heart failure. So if you have diabetes, you are at risk for heart failure, unless until you're very young. Otherwise, you are at risk of heart failure. I mean, there are various tools which you can apply, the Kiru score, the, uh, the Framingham score, etc. I'm not going into that. Uh, this new thing which has come is pre-heart failure. Now, there was a fashion about pre-diabetes, early, uh, early hypertension. So why should heart failure stay behind? So heart failure also come up with a pre-heart failure stage, which is called stage B. Patients without current or prior symptoms of heart failure, but evidence of one of the following, structural heart disease. So the moment your type 2 diabetic patient on echo has LVH, or any ball motion abnormality, he becomes a pre-heart failure. He still does not have the symptoms or signs of heart failure. Antiproprioty is not raised yet. Abnormal cardiac function, reduced uh, systolic function, etc. Then heart failure stage C, this is what you and I see or we are dealing with. And advanced heart failure, they are severe symptoms, they need to be managed by a cardiology colleague. What is the prevalence of heart failure and diabetes? If you see this slide, you will keep wondering. I and mean, I keep wondering. If I see this slide, a very old slide, but uh, still holds true. Two-fold more common in men and five-fold more common in women with type 2 diabetes. This is the Framingham database. You can say this is the American database. We don't have heart for Indian data as, as the exact prevalence. I will accept that. But this is the best we have. 12% people with type 2 diabetes of heart failure. Prevalence rises with age. Now, this sentence bothers me, you see. 12% means one in eight. One in eight. Now, think about it. I mean, most of us are seeing... I mean, I see few patients, I'm privileged, but many of you may be seeing 30 to 50 patients per day in your clinic. So one in eight, which means you should be seeing something like five patients with diabetes and heart failure in your clinic, if you believe this, this, this prevalence story. 3.3% of people with type 2 diabetes have heart failure. Each year, 1% rise in HbA1c corresponds to 15% increase in risk of heart failure. All these statements take with a pinch of salt, with all observational studies, they've put together all the observational studies, they've done all sorts of uh, statistical, what you call uh, jargon, trying to make everything as best matched as possible. But still, the message goes through that if your glycemic control is poor, you have a higher risk of heart uh, heart failure. This is my question, which I ask: uh, Are we missing uh, people with type two diabetes and heart failure in their clinics? I'm not examining them. They have a little bit of ankle edema. We blame it on uh, on the amlodipine, or they have a little bit of shortness of breath. We blame it on the anemia or the mildly reduced EGFR. Uh, we don't go ahead and do X-ray, echo, etc. I mean, I don't know. Or the other side of the point is, is the prevalence not as high as has been mentioned in the slide before, because there are all various observational studies, and whenever you do observation study, you're biased, you're going out looking for heart failure out of every 100 people you see, may not be throwing out 30, 40, you did not have heart failure, then you calculate the whole thing on, on, on the 60 people, so the percentage becomes high. These are issues. But having said that, after that heart failure story has come into the picture, when the SGL2 inhibitors came into the market and they showed this benefit, we have all become a bit more, what you call, aware of it. And we all are probably picking a little bit more heart failure, but I, I nowhere near these numbers. I'm, I'm still not picking up near, near these numbers, but maybe uh, during question and answer session, one of you may challenge me, Dr. Mukherjee, you're not doing routine echoes in everybody, Dr. Mukherjee, not spending enough time with your patients. So this is an open question, but keep it on mind that heart failure is an issue in people with type 2 diabetes. Once you get heart failure in type 2 diabetes, I, I took out those slides, your prognosis is quite bad. Your, your five-year mortality, all-cause mortality, five, not even five years, the data was three and a half year all-cause mortality was 40%. And the risk of cardiovascular death is also to the tier of 35 to 45%. At three, three and a half years, if you have type 2 diabetes with heart failure. So, heart failure in a type 2 diabetic patient is bad news. You have to be very aggressive in managing it. And you should now use medications which can change, change this uh, scenario, which can reduce cardiovascular mortality and reduce all cause mortality. So, which brings us to the question of which anti diabetic agent in person with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. 
Now, these are the medications available to us. We don't have amylin, we don't have uh, bilateral salts I put out here. I did not put the dopamine agonists. I don't consider them as antidiabetic agents. So we have metformin, SU, glenides type, uh, TZD, alpha glucose inhibitors, insulin, GLP-1, DP-4, SGLP-2 inhibitors. So which of these should we be considering in people with type 2 uh, diabetes with heart failure? If you don't want to listen to the rest of the lecture, you can go have a cup of coffee, just take a picture of the slide. Because whatever I'm going to say is the consensus that we all got together in the in the diabetes India under the umbrella of uh, of, of uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu and, uh, and the Diabetes India group. We had a, 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 a call, uh, consensus meeting on heart failure type 2 diabetes as to which anti-diabetic medic medications to use. Uh, this was uh, part of idea group, but uh, in, con in, in conjunction with the diabetes, uh, under the umbrella of diabetes India. And what we decided was uh, we wanted to make it more clinically oriented. We want to make it more clinically oriented. What should you and I do when we see a patient sitting in front of us in the clinic? So we made it as person with type 2 diabetes at high risk for heart failure. They do not have heart failure yet. So it's basically that state. Now the latest classification says stage A and pre-diabetes, stage A and stage B. This is that group. People with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, maybe at past history of AMI, still do not have heart failure, but very high risk of heart failure. Age is more, diabetes, multiple risk factors. Person with type 2 diabetes with compensated heart failure, i.e. is known to have heart failure, is seeing your cardiology colleague already on uh, ACE, ARB, on a beta blocker, uh, already being managed for heart failure, is compensated. He's got NYHA class 1 now on medications, happily comes to see you in the clinic every 3-4 months for diabetes management and all the other comorbidities management. So he's compensated heart failure. And then there's one who's got type 2 diabetes with decompensated heart failure, comes to your clinic huffing and puffing, ankle edema, rals. You uh, promptly send it to the him or her to the emergency or to your cardiology colleague for either admission or urgent management of heart failure. So these are the three groups which came to our mind. If there's anything more in between, please discuss in the question answer session. And we went about discussing these three groups. So metformin. Do we have any randomized control trial data in management uh, in use of metformin in, in, in heart failure? We don't have. But we have a lot of observational data. If you see a lot of studies dating back from 2005 to 2011, maybe our RCT is, is, is calling, but I don't think it will be done really. So this is adjusted hazard ratio for all cause mortality from nine. Uh, what, what, should, what, what should I say? Uh, uh, statistically, uh, more reliable studies, the observational data, there are issues, but the, the, the best that they could uh, uh, adjust for, for the various other risk factors, if you find that it seems there is a reduction in, in, in mortality in people with type 2 diabetes with heart failure receiving metformin. And the worry that metformin will cause increased risk of lactic acidosis was more not met in any of these nine studies. However, EGFR below 30, you're not supposed to heart failure, no heart failure, metformin is contraindicated, we all know that. Another study of uh, systematic review of 17 observational studies, clinical outcomes of metformin using populations with chronic kidney disease, heart failure, and liver disease. So just leave the, uh, the, the kidney disease, focus on the heart failure, all-cause mortality, there was a 22% statistically significant reduction. Cardiovascular mortality seemed like a 23% reduction, but that was not statistically significant. And uh, heart failure readmission, which is a big deal uh, in people with, uh, with heart failure with, with or without diabetes, was also reduced 13%, and that was statistically significant. That's exactly what's written here. So that's the data we have with metformin. Uh, if you can dig, you will find more data. You, Dr. Mukherjee, I, I, I did this study, that study. I, I accept it. I give in. There are many other studies. Initially, we used to think that metformin should not be used in people with heart failure. That concept has completely changed. NYHA1, NYHA2, NYHA3. You can happily use metformin as long as EGFR allows that. If they have an EGFR of 20, certainly metformin is ruled out. What about people with NYHA class 4, that is acute decompensate heart failure admitted in hospital with an EGFR of 50? Would they be using metformin or not? I do not know the answer. This is an open question. Uh, it's a debate. I do not know the answer. What do I do? I generally don't use metformin in people who have been admitted in the CCU, ICU with decomposite heart failure, even though my renal function allows me to use it. Why? Because uh, the, the data is, is meager there. Coming to sulfonylurea and glenides, I mean, I could spend the next two hours discussing this. There are hundreds of observational data, some saying bad, some saying good, some saying uh, neutral. Uh, good, very few, mostly are neutral or bad. 
So uh, sulfonyl ureas, their observation data, again, there's no RCT, which makes life a little bit difficult. But then when you come to the Carmelina trial of Lina and Glimiparite, uh, there, unfortunately, there was no placebo arm. A placebo arm would have helped clarify. There was no increase of heart failure with, with glimiparide in the Carmelina group. Now, whether that was uh, because uh, of uh, comparison with Lina Glipin, we don't know. Now, thiazolidine dions, yes, we cannot use them. We all know this, that uh, thiazolidine dions in people with type 2 diabetes who are at high risk of heart failure precipitates heart failure, so increases risk of hospitalization due to heart failure. Uh, that is uh, what's uh, written there. So you have serious heart failure, persistent significant disability, persistent significant incapability, and prolonged hospital stay. So uh, 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 TZD should not be used in people with type 2 diabetes with high risk of heart failure. That does not mean that we should not be using TZD in type 2 diabetics, younger diabetics who do not have too many risk factors because TZDs have a lot of other benefits. My practice, again, there are questions coming. I'm happy to use it for the first 18 to 24 months in my newly diagnosed type of diabetics because short of insulin, this is the only other medicine which, which works on the lipolytic pathway. The previous speaker was talking about the octet. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors, we do not have a primary focused randomized control trial, but we all know about the ACE trial, a large trial of uh, ACARBOS, uh, primarily done in China, uh, trying to show any cardiovascular benefit. It turned out to be a neutral study, and there were there was a small subcomponent of people who, who developed heart failure in this large trial of 3,000 patients, only about 2%, and it was not more in the in, in the ACARBOS group. And that makes sense because ACARBOS, uh, I can't pick up any mechanism by which it will either uh, uh, improve or worsen heart failure, except maybe the increased GLP-1 to a small degree, to a small, to, to a small about 1, 1. 1.5 times uh, the level, maybe that, that might be beneficial, but there is absolutely no data. Henceforth, as the previous speaker was mentioning, we now come into the newer molecules, the DPP-4 is GLP-1. We have a lot more data with these molecules. Now, DPP-4 inhibitors, you must have heard these talks. Ad nauseum, uh, this was a big differentiator between the DPP-4 inhibitors. We all know glycemic control is almost similar. The big differentiator was the uh, increased risk of hospitalization due to heart failure. These are people who did not have heart failure, but when they were given uh, in the Saber TB trial, in the Saxagliptin trial, there was a statistically significantly increased risk of heart failure, which put a cloud on the entire DPP-4 inhibitor group. Then came alogliptin, which showed a uh, increased risk of heart failure, but it was not statistically significant. Seeing these two, FDA put a black box warning for all of them. But now, latest uh, European Society of Cardiology guideline does allow you to use uh, uh, citagliptin and linagliptin in people with heart failure. So, uh, NYHA class two, NYHA class one, I'm happy to use NYHA class three, plus minus NYHA class four, I will not be using it for IET to admit to hospital, I will not be using it. GLP-1 separate agonist, I think we discussed a lot about GLP-1. We must have had a number of lectures in this meeting also on GLP-1. But in real life, the number of people who are taking GLP-1 is, is not that high for many reasons. Primarily, I would say cost, cost, cost. And unless the cost comes down, all this theoretical discussion we have about GLP-1 remains theoretical, uh, barring the, the small number of patients that you're using GLP-1 separate agonists in. Now, GLP-1 separate agonists and heart failure data is not very strong. Uh, if you see each individual, these are all the various cardiovascular outcome trials with the GLP-1 agonist. If you take lixisinatide, if you take liraglutide, if you take semaglutide, exenatide, uh, dulaglutide, oral semaglutide, in none of them did you, you, you saw any heart failure benefit, reduction in hospital, hospital admissions for heart failure. There was no benefit. Surprisingly, albiglutide, uh, which has now been given up by GSK, the so called the Harmony Outcomes Trial, unequivocally showed a statistically significant 29% reduction. This is open to discussion why we don't know. And then when you do a meta-analysis of all these trials, which have a different uh, duration of follow-up, different characteristics of patients, combine them and do a, do a, statistic, uh, do a meta-analysis and show that there's a 9% reduction risk for hospital heart failure just meet the statistical significance, I, I, I'm still not convinced. I'm still not convinced that GLP-1 is going to reduce risk of hospitalization with the heart failure. With regards to 3P MACE, absolutely no doubt. I mean, uh, liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, all have data about reduction in 3P MACE. Liraglutide has data with reduction in cardiovascular mortality. But HHF, hospitalization, heart failure, it's weak data. 
And in fact, you have the, the trials done with liraglutide in people with heart failure. So effect of liraglutide LV function in stable heart failure patients with or without diabetes, it was an LV ejection fraction endpoint uh, uh, study, small study, sorry. Went, uh, and there if you see the change in LV ejection fraction was 0.7 in the, in the, the liraglutide arm and 1.5%, so the placebo did better. So the placebo subtracted, liraglutide did not do well with, regard, with regards to preservation of left ventricular ejection fraction. And if you can read down here, there were issues, the heart rate went up, there were more serious cardiovascular events. So nobody recommends a GLP-1 agonist, even though there were very nice studies initially with regards to uh, the, the atherosclerotic disease. It reduces the size of myocardial infarction, et cetera. But with regards to heart failure, we don't have that data. Coming to SGLT2 inhibitors, I think I still have uh, seven minutes, chairperson, sir. But anytime you feel I'm overshooting, please tell me, I will wrap up. So SGLT2 inhibitors, I have intentionally not kept too many slides because you have heard these studies 50 times. I have just taken one slide each which drives home the point. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors, the four major trials, or 2 glyphosin I've not added here, is Emparec with empagliflozin, Canvas with Tanagliflozin, and Declatin with Apagliflozin. These were the cardiovascular endpoint, 3P MACE endpoint, where they got the heart failure data as a secondary outcome, and there was unequivocally statistically significant 31% reduction in risk of heart failure. Once they got this, <clears throat> they started thinking of why not use it in people with established heart failure. So the initial studies were done in people with have REF, reduced ejection fraction, and once they got success there, they have now moved on to HEF PEF. So these are the HEF-REF studies, DAPA heart failure, emperor reduced, and sotagliflozin, which we don't use here, soloist. Then the two studies, one has already been published. You must have heard it in this meeting, the emperor preserved study, which is again a groundbreaking. Like EMPA-REG was a groundbreaking study. Similarly, empa preserved is a ground uh, path breaking study, and we are waiting with bated breath about the deliver study, DAPA glyphosin preserved heart failure. Now, this is DAPA heart failure, not all were diabetics. So now slowly, non uh, as the last speaker said, diabetes, uh, cardiology, diabetology, and nephrology coming together. Only 42% patients were diabetic, all had reduced ejection fraction less than uh, uh, 40 almost a quarter were Asia Pacific patients so comes closer to our to our country and if you see there was 26 percent reduction in CV death or hospital and heart failure and this was primarily driven by hospital and heart failure but in the DAPA heart failure study you also got a CV death benefit declared TB you did not get but in this specified subgroup of patients type 2 diabetes or without diabetes with heart failure with ejection fraction less than 40 percent if you use 10 milligram DAPA glucosin you not only get reduction in uh, uh, heart failure, also get cardiovascular death. Similar say, finding was seen in Emperor Reduced. Emperor Reduced showed you a 25% reduction in the composite outcome of cardiovascular death of hospital and heart failure. But in Emperor Reduced, the entire thing was driven by reduction in hospitalized into heart failure. Cardiovascular death benefit was not seen, but there was a nom nom nominal 8% reduction. So that we frozen, I will leave, and then comes the Emperor Preserved Study. As I said, Deliver, the DAPA Preserved Study is still uh, about to be published. Sometime very soon it will come out. This is a path-breaking study because for 20 years, we did not have any drugs to treat people with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, the Emperor Preserved has shown you a, a significant result, CV death or heart failure reduction. Again, this was primarily driven by reduction in heart failure, not because of CV death. And there was reduction in the EGFR slope. So last but not the least is insulins. There's only one slide. We do not have any hard randomized controlled trial data here. We only have the DEVO trial and the ORIGIN trial. They were done in very, uh, ORIGIN was done in very early diabetics. DEVO was done in very, uh, we do not have much data on heart failure. But do whatever you do. Insulin is still the drug of choice in people with NYHA class 4. So in conclusion, this is my conclusion side. Management of glycemia in a person with type 2 diabetes with heart failure. If you are not giving an SGLT2 inhibitor, you have to justify why. If a type 2 diabetic patient comes to you who's got established cardiovascular disease, is at high risk for heart disease, has got albuminuria, has got an EGFR below 60, or has got heart failure. If you're not using an SGLT2, 
please justify that. The question in the Viva will now be, please justify why you're not giving an SGT trainer beta. Metformin, I'll be happy to use up to NYHA class three. As to why, whether to use an NYHA class four, we can have a discussion. TZDs, no. Saxagliptin, no. Allogliptin, no. Sita, Lina can, but they do not have any beneficial effect. Alpha glucose inhibitors, we use a lot in India and China. I think we can continue. Insulins, we will keep continuing no matter how many observational data you throw at me, saying Dr. Mukherjee, this observational data, that observational study shows it increases the heart failure with insulin because in NYJ class 4, you don't have anything else other than insulin and probably a GT2 inhibitor just once they are discharged. GFP1 agonists are, are, are equivocal. SU and glides are equivocal. I'm not saying they're contraindicated. I'm saying they're equivocal. With that, I will stop. I'm, I'm sure this is a controversial uh, topic. There might be some questions. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Ishwar. Thank you very much. Thank